For nine years, South Africa has faced what some term a silent coup under a president who allegedly allowed private interests to take over the state. As the country's economy collapsed, the world watched a once glorious moral beacon fade away. Now, it seems, is the time for reckoning. In my view, the allegations are so serious that they go to the very foundations of our constitutional democracy. As another parliamentary inquiry into alleged state capture in the Department of Mineral Resources is about to begin, we look at how unfettered power allegedly operated in public and private spaces, leaving what seems a trail of destruction. In that meeting he indicated to us that <coughs> the minister, Mr. Museben Zizwani, prefers this other old comrade to become one of the B partners. What lessons can the country learn from this as South Africa charts its way ahead and is there hope after the capture? My name is Leboha Marumule and I started my mining career as a student mining engineer with the JCI in 1991 and at the time I was placed at the mine called Union Section that was right there in Swart Club and uh, I went up the ranks to become the mine manager, general mine manager of the mine. Uh, in between that I did my uh, BTEC degree with the University of Johannesburg. I did my Postgrad with Vets University, the GD in Mining Engineering, and I just just completed my MBA and I'm a registered professional mining engineer. And um, I quit my job as a, as the um, general mine manager in 2012. That's when I started opening up my own company called Marmula Mining and Investments. After earning their stripes in the industry. Lebohang Marumule and friend Stephen Manyatela say they learnt that this mine, Kopanang Mine in Clarksdorp, at the time owned by Anglo Gold Ashanti, was about to be closed. They say they then expressed interest in purchasing it, despite that the owner's intention was to close it. Anglo Gold Ashanti indicated to us that there is a possibility to be, be partners of the other company. We then agreed in principle. And that was obviously, you know, set in a letter. And we were then phoned by Owen O'Brien. The BEE partners called their business Kopanang Shaft 9 and held a number of meetings with various concerned parties. In terms of the proposed deal, the majority partner would be a Chinese company called Heaven Sent South Africa. The first BEE deal would be held by Kopanang Shaft 9. The second BEE deal share was also a 9% holding by an unknown party and another minority stake of 8% would be held by the Employees Trust. Heaven Sent South Africa already owns 74% of South Africa's village main reef mine, which in turn owns Tau Lekwa Mine, whose CEO is the same Owen O'Brien. According to Marumule, O'Brien represented Heaven Sent South Africa in negotiating the BEE deal with them. They say they exchanged a few draft agreements, but as they were about to sign the final agreement, they received shocking news. What then happened was that Owen called us and uh, in that meeting he indicated to us that <coughs> the minister, Mr. Museben Zizwani, prefers his other old comrade to become one of the BE partners. When I said, Owen, look, <laughs> I mean, we are business people. I don't understand why should you be given an instruction by the minister. Then he said to me, Lebo, these things, they do happen and... We don't want to be on his wrong side because December is conference and, you know, uh, these guys definitely they're going to emerge. Former Mineral Resources Minister Mose Ben Zizwane did not respond to our request for an interview. His former department is quoted in media denying he ever influenced this deal. Village Main Reef also denies the allegations and says they were competing with five other BEE partners and no guarantees were made to Kopanang Shaft 9. 
The company further denies the involvement of then Minister Moseben Zizwane and says they have the prerogative to choose their partner and claim that their employees are the majority shareholders. In a WhatsApp message apparently from O'Brien, he allegedly promises to finalize the BEE process and send out the final agreements. The company refuses to reveal who the BEE partners are. The partners' quest for answers has not yielded any results. They wrote to the office of the then Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa and the Competition Commission to intervene. They say they will approach the courts. This is basically the same mine that we have shown interest in terms of purchasing the mine. And then on my right is the, the hostel where the employees stay. In terms of the deal itself, it incorporated the shaft, uh, the hostel, including the plant, which is not here, but it's about eight to ten cases from here. I believe that uh, obviously the mining charter is it's, it's monitored or it's, it's governed by our own government. But if the very same government as the one failing us, I don't really see how economic transformation in terms of black in industrialists is going to happen in South Africa. I mean, for me, it's just a myth. It's not going to happen for as long as we, 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 we are subjected to decisions like this. Nations, 44 matches live on SABC One and 19 SABC radio stations. SABC is the official broadcaster of the 2018 FIFA World Cup Russia. where there are clear cases, clear cases of uh, wrong that has been done, that must commence immediately. Something is being done about corruption in our currency, even although it strengthened dramatically after the ANC's recent elected conference, could conceivably go, go stronger yet. He had a soul that would not be for sale. Stay tuned to Your World for your final news roundup, Monday to Sunday at 21.30. Black Empowerment Partners Lebohang Marumule and Stephen Manyatela believe that due to the interference of former Mineral Resources Minister Moseben Zizwane, they lost out on a mining deal. This is after Zwane allegedly instructed the mine to give the deal to his friend, apparently a comrade who spent time in Russia. The company refuses to disclose the name of its BEE partner. We are locals around Tlexop area. We we, have, we are industrialists, we are entrepreneurs, we are, we've worked at the mines, we, we, you know, we have all what it takes to actually be the, be the, you know, the forefront or maybe taking over the mines. So, yeah, that's my understanding of the, charters, of the mining charter. So now, if at all, uh, the minister who should be the custodian of the mining charter or who should be driving this comes and says, Nope, not this one, but my own comrade. I don't know, maybe his comrade is also like a mining engineer or, or you know, an ex-miner. I don't know. I, Musebenzi Joseph Zwane, swear that I will be faithful to the Republic of South Africa and will obey 
respect and uphold the constitution and all other law of the republic. Soon after his appointment, Zwane's name was associated with this wedding. South Africans were shocked to learn about the alleged details behind the widely publicized Gupta wedding. Before his appointment as Mineral Resources Minister in 2015, Mosebenzi Zizwane was a little-known politician in the Free State. But his name was later associated with the wedding, with allegations that as MEC for the Free State's Department of Agriculture, he invited a Gupta wedding guest to South Africa under the pretense of a state visit. It is also alleged that under Zwane, the Free State paid 30 million rand towards the controversial Gupta wedding. Mark Haywood and Section 27 have had first-hand experience of the impact of government decisions on ordinary people. I was aware of a situation in relation to, to, to Zwani where MEC, then MEC Malakwani abused his position as MEC for Health to instruct a hospital to admit the relative of Moseben Zizwani into the IC unit at Dithlebeng Hospital in Bethlehem and kick out somebody who was occupying that bed in the ICU unit already, contributing to the death of that, of that patient. While he was a free state politician, Zwane allegedly released millions of rands that were meant to benefit previously disadvantaged workers at the Estina farm to Gupta-owned businesses. Why would anybody that needs any issue to deal with agriculture in Free State not go to Free State and ask if they don't get answers, then they can come to me. Let me place it on record that the idea behind Freddy Dairy came with me so that everybody knows. I initiated it, I met with all the political parties including DA. Under Zwane's watch, Glencore was apparently forced to sell its mines to the Guptas. The previous minister, Nwako Ramatrodi, was allegedly fired because he refused to suspend Glencore's license. The National Union of Mine Workers raised concern over how under Zwane's leadership, the Guptas were apparently allowed to tap into rehabilitation funds. The Guptas, when they took over, they did not pay any cent from their pocket. There's a fund that is called the um, Rehabilitation Fund. Uh, which is a DMR fund. It's paid by all companies that acquires uh, the Section 11 uh, to operate in the mining industry. So we are told and we hear rumors that uh, the Guptas were given 600 million from that fund for them to purchase uh, those mines. Now, in a bid to save hundreds of jobs, the mines are under business rescue after the last bank willing to do business with the Guptas, the Bank of Baroda, announced that it was pulling out of South Africa. The National Union of Mine Workers disagrees with the business rescue option. There's a potential of losing jobs, but you must understand that uh, Optimum Mine is a very productive mine. It has a lot of uh, deposit of coal. It can be bought even tomorrow if it is put on sale. Hence our position that that mine should be put on sale. There's no reason of putting that mine under business rescue or care maintenance because there are a lot of investors out there who are looking for a, a productive mine. It seems Zwane's impact lingers among the staff of the Department of Mineral Resources. Various sources have told Special Assignment that from the time of his arrival, the ex-minister seemed like a man on a mission. First, he brought in his Free State Chief of Staff, Sepaiti Tlamini, and made her Deputy Director General of Mineral Regulation, allegedly without following procedure. The person acting in that portfolio, Joel Rapella, resigned as a result and remains unemployed. The Director General at the time, Tiberi Ramoncha, resigned four months after Zwane arrived. It is alleged that Zwane ruled by fear and staff were moved around to suit his agenda and those who disagreed were dealt with harshly. 
an Mpumalanga regional manager, has just been reinstated following his firing for serving a notice on one of the Gupta mines. He's one of the earliest examples of active state capture in the country. And his appointment to Minister of Mineral Resources is also exceedingly questionable because his CV was sent to Duduzani Zuma, the son of Jacob Zuma, before his appointment was actually made. We laid a case, um, criminal charges against him for his dealings and also, um, you know, sabotaging and, 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 and using undue influence because of his official office. So if, um, and, and, and that report will be made available to um, Mr. Judge Zondo's inquiry into state capture. It's quite detailed with regards to the transgressions that he's accused of. The Mineral Resources Portfolio Committee is instituting a full inquiry on alleged state capture in the department under Zwane, with the former minister being expected to appear as a witness. We had to, have, uh, to, to start the process first by inviting the minister, making, uh, uh, some, get some clarities in terms of the knowledge. Subsequent to that, we then have to make a determination how do we conduct the investigation. The parliamentary inquiry will focus on issues relating to the Department of Mineral Resources, though it is aware that other issues may arise during the process. There is no other matter for at this stage that we can make uh, reference to except the, 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 the transaction which um, Tegeta Glenko um, and the issue of the dairy uh, farm in, 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 in the Free State, in Fred, which again, it's something that happened many years, but so the bigger question is that it doesn't fall on the rhyme of the, of the committee, why committee on mineral resources at that stage is a matter that uh, happened in the, in the Free State. Should Parliament have intervened earlier when allegations started surfacing? I don't think the committee should exempt itself. It will have to ask a question. Did we do what we're supposed to do as a committee? I don't think we should hide it. And if we say we could have done better, what lessons are we learning? In his previous appearance, Zwani insisted that he can never be captured. My history will tell you that nobody can capture me. I have not been appointed just because I'm liked. I've served my credentials as a cadre in the ANC. I've never been a spy, and I'll not be one in any future. Zwane is but one of a number of politicians and leaders of state-owned enterprises who have been questioned for allegedly aiding and abetting the process of state capture. Now, with the establishment of the Zondo Commission, there's hope that the country will come closer to understanding the scale of the reported corruption. In my view, the allegations are so serious that they go to the very foundations of our constitutional democracy. As you know, some of the allegations are that certain people or individuals offered ministerial posts to certain people and it, it is people who would have no constitutional power to make any such offers. Our stories how do I begin? Our lives. When all seems to fail, we will raise our voices a bit louder for our justice. Well, I went into absolute shock. My whole body was shaky. I couldn't hold a phone. But there he was. I couldn't believe the nonchalant that they were still in the area two weeks later. And in times when the justice system is not able to help us with our individual battles. I'm willing to do anything 
These are stories on Cutting Edge Channel 404. Before 1994, all the good public values about government did not come from the professional politicians because they were party politicians. In the main, in the main, those came from civil society and the, and the religious organizations that were campaigning for good public values. And somehow, we surrendered this, this important responsibility to politicians after 1994. Reverend Mpumlwana is one of the civil society members from the religious sector who started raising alarm about state capture when it was first reported. Last year, a report was released by the South African Council of Churches Unburdening Panel, which allowed people to report whatever they had witnessed. We need to give, give greater uh, confidence in the officials that are there, that they have got a job to do as professionals. And there are many, 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 the majority of them are good professionals, but they get corrupted by the situation. We've also let, dealt with people who have been told that you do this, or if you don't do it, you're out of here. In some cases, because we've now told you this, your life is also at stake. People have told us this. And so they have had to commit things or have been pressured to commit things or they have known of people that have been in that situation because, uh, and of course we've seen how people have died, councillors who have refused to support a corrupt cause have, have, have lost their lives and this is happening in our country. Civil society and some significant political events have been credited for the pushback against state capture. Ivor Chipkin is part of a group of academics who released the Betrayal of the Promise report, which concluded that there has been a silent coup in South Africa. There's been a political shift in the African National Congress. Uh, the Zuma faction has suffered, a, if not a, a, a loss, at least a massive, a massive uh, setback. Um, we'll see if it's managed to to, to, to re-emerge in, in, in some form. Uh, Parliament has found its voice again. Uh, there's the state capture inquiry which is about to proceed. Um, so I think there's enormous progress. I think for me what is most exciting of all of this is that over the last year, especially over the last year, we've seen a re-emergence of powerful, committed, brave civil society organizations. The game change, of course, is the, the arrival of the EFF. Whether you like their tactics or not, the point is that they definitely brought to Parliament a, a life uh, which, it, which it didn't have previously. But the DA were asking important questions. Um, what has changed is something within the African National Congress. And I think this is what you saw in the SABC inquiry, was that uh, key ANC members of Parliament started to play an independent role. It seems the tentacles of the alleged capture stretch to other spheres of government. The Northwest Premier's office has recently been raided. This follows allegations that the Guptas were irregularly given a tender to provide unneeded mobile health services where millions were paid before the services were received. Will the Zondo Commission be able to effectively deal with the scale of the problem? A huge part of corruption is actually happening at the local level. Part of the state capture, so to say. In my view, people have to pay their way for everything. And in fact, only some people get certain positions because of the corruption that's at play. So it's not possible to deal with all of this through the commission. Some of it depends on the kind of messaging that comes and the reforms that will happen within uh, uh, the organs of state across the board, including departments and provinces, as well as, 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 as municipalities. So I don't think we really know what we're talking about yet when we talk about state capture. We know what we think are the lead actors in state capture but we don't know who the supporting actors were in state capture. So there's no cause for complacency. Yes, I think that we've made 
significant progress, and I think it's been a victory for people's power in a sense up to now. But we've made progress in, in, in stemming the tide. We're beginning to push back, but we haven't pushed back sufficiently and we haven't understood the problem. As the country begins to reimagine a state capture free South Africa, experts warn that much more needs to be done institutionally. The South African Council of Churches, uh, following our experience in the unbending panel, came to the conclusion that it is no longer about President Zuma. It is about the way government functions, the whole governmental environment has actually become, in, you know, it's, it's become a toxic environment. Civil society is engaged in a process that looks beyond state capture and is holding discussions on a range of issues from how to deal with the woundedness of our society, poverty and inequality, and our social values and standards to anchoring democracy. This is now an opportunity uh, in this sort of democratic opening which we have now to start addressing those structural issues, structural problems with the way government is organised. There are several, uh, the most dramatic of them, uh, and if you speak to public servants they will tell you on an ongoing basis the extraordinary levels of political pressure that they are subject to. It can't just be left to activists. Citizens have to find their voice, they have to find their feet, they have to find their rights, they have to demand information and then act on that information. That's, that's the biggest lesson from this whole state capture attitude, which was the people went to sleep. When the people went to sleep, the thieves came in and they stole all the furniture in the house. Back in Clarkstorp, Lebochang Marumole and Stephen Manyatela hope the courts will vindicate them. Marumole's only contract with the mine has just been cancelled. He believes it is victimization for complaining about the BEE deal. But Anglo Gold Ashanti and Village Main Reef deny the allegation. Anglo Gold Ashanti says it is due to their failure to meet contractual obligations. And Village Main Reef says their name was not among the contracts transferred from Anglo Gold Ashanti. I think what we have failed to do in the state capture discussion is link the very large amounts of money that we say were stolen, the billions, with the impact of that theft at the ground level, which again is why I think part of the response to state capture is not just the issues of justice and punishment, it's also the issues of repair and restoration and a plan to try to undo the damage that has been done.